All right. Well, welcome everyone to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. We are glad you're joining us. This is a first for many reasons. One, it is the first episode uh, for us to do, really, uh, besides a few psalms that aren't in the Torah. Yeah. So this is... (laughs) Yeah. So if this is your first of the Spoken Gospel podcast to see or listen to, uh, we have others. We have like 75 (laughs) others that are in the Torah. So Seth and I are very energetic because this is the first time out of the Torah for us. And like uh, the narrative. Yep. I mean, there's been a lot of narrative in the Torah elements throughout the Torah, but this is a sustained piece of narrative that you read like a more like. You would read Jane Austen, then yes. you would read right. like uh, whatever. Yeah, a so, law code. So that's yeah. one. That's one new thing. The, the second new thing is we are filming this. So if yeah. you're listening to this on the podcast, um, it's actually being filmed right now, and we're gonna put it up on our YouTube channel, yep. YouTube.com/slash/SpokenGospel. Or if you're on YouTube right now, hello, hello, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> Seth's looking directly to camera. Uh, <laughs> Am I not so supposed to do that, that? I don't know. You know, that's a. Uh, Mate, we'll you probably can't hear. We, you know, traditionally, I'm you're not making eye to. contact with you're, my you're our connecting. followers. I'm connecting with our people. Hello, I see I you. I see you are seen see and loved. You. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and then the third uh, first is that this is the first episode that we are recording where we are both in the spoken gospel offices. Yes. So that's exciting. When did you guys get the offices? Uh, we moved in in November. Okay. Yeah. So it's March now. So and fun. so, uh, yeah, we've been here like five months, and you came down from Kansas City to hang out with us for a few days. That's so exactly right. we're thankful for that. So anyway, we are starting the book of Esther today. Esther. The book of Esther. I love the book of Esther. I have fallen in love with this book. It is masterfully written. It's a great story. It's a great story, too. It's also just a very interesting story. Yes. And so, yeah. But I, I heard the story of Esther as a kid. Yep, totally. And I probably did not actually hear the story of Esther as a kid. Yeah, right? I had this like really kind of, uh, I mean, whitewashed vision of like Esther as this really virtuous person in the middle of a hostile place who saves her people, which is true. Yeah. But that's all I got. Yeah. And like there's so much more to the story of Esther than a powerful woman being faithful to God in Persia. That's there. It's there. But there's so much more. Yeah. It's and so, so fascinating. So what we're going to do today, what we're going to try to do today is... Um, uh, is kind of take on the first three chapters with an eye to the fact that the book of Esther is best read as a cohesive whole. Yeah, you can't really study chapter one of Esther without also thinking about chapter 10 of Esther. Yes. It's really difficult Yep. Uh, because the whole st- story is a chiasm. Yeah, fancy word. A fancy word, which just means that every part of the story has a parallel in another part of the story. Yep. Uh, if you think back to like our Leviticus podcast, we talked about how the book of Leviticus is set up like a mountain yep. and how a lot of Jewish literature has at its, as its climax, the center of the story, yeah, the middle of the story. And so the way Esther works is that there chapter one and two is paralleled by chapters nine and 10 yep. and chapter three is paralleled by chapter eight. And ch- the second half of chapter three is paralleled by the first part of mm-hmm. chapter eight. It's this mountain. It's this mountain going up to the center where you have this huge reversal happening Mm -hmm. between the fortunes of Haman and the fortunes of Mordecai, who we'll introduce in a second. And that forms the central point of the entire story. Mm -hmm. So as you read the book of Esther, it only takes about... 20 minutes, 15 mm-hmm. minutes. I think you double speed. You listen to it for fifty. Yeah, eight pretty minutes. Quick. I, yeah, I listened to it for like the last two weeks on my 15 minute drive to work, and yeah. I could I could finish it from door to door. Yeah, so it goes by really fast, yeah. and so as you're listening, you should be reading it with an eye to say say, oh, this happened over here. Uh-huh. This and same even thing, the same language, same like language. Yeah. So like a really simple example is so in chapter one and two, which we're about to talk about, mm-hmm. there's this huge feast, right, that displays the king's greatness. And at the very end, there's another huge feast that talks about Mordecai's greatness, right. and how great of a how great of a, a human being and yep. savior he Ultimate is. Ultimate reversal. Ultimate reversal. In chapter three, it talks about Haman's elevation to power, and in chapter eight, it talks about how Mordecai is elevated to power. Yes. Uh, in chapter three, you also have Haman's decree, to, decree like his edict to kill uh-huh. the Jews, and in chapter eight, you also have Mordecai's decree to save the Jews, yep. like and to kill those who were trying to kill them. Yes. Yeah. And around that central moment when Haman's and Mordecai's like uh, fortunes are reversed, you have a feast on either side of it mm-hmm. where Esther is asking the king to do something for her on either side. On one side of it, you have Haman setting up uh, a gallows for Mordecai to be hanged on. And the other side, you have him being hanged on the gallows. Like the that he whole, set up. Yeah. The whole story 
has a parallel on the other side. So yes. you can't talk about one half of the story right. without talking about the other. So traditionally, we usually try to take on like chapters at a time and really drill down, which we're going to try to do still. But we will be making reference to the whole of the book as we go because you have to yeah. to understand any of this rightly. So... Um, Our encouragement would be then yeah. to read the book. Read the book every week. Yeah, that we have a podcast on. Yep. It. If you're if you're following along with this, just uh, listen and read the book, and then yeah. listen again and read the book again, and you'll see new things every time. It's it's really yep. fun. We've had a lot of fun studying this book. Yeah, it's been great. Um, so um, let's kind of set this story in its context. Yeah. Right. So the people of Israel are in exile. Um, they've been in exile, and this is what even, is an exile. So exile is, uh, and we just finished the Torah. So yeah, we, yeah. yeah so if you if you were with us in Deuteronomy, uh, the people of God were living in Jerusalem after conquesting the land, and they disobeyed God. They broke the covenant, and so as a punishment for that, God told them this was going to happen in the Torah. In the book of Deuteronomy, he yeah. kicks them out of the land, drives them out first with the Assyrians and then the Babylonians, and then, the Babylonians, and then uh, God raises up a emperor named Cyrus in Syria. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and they all like yeah. dispossess the land in different ways, um, until the land is having its Sabbath, the right. land is of, of Israel's resting. And now the well, Jews kind of are in the in... middle of the exile narrative. So like, like we're like the, the exile covers a lot of the biblical books. Of the it Bible. does. Yeah. So we're talking about most of the prophets, all the prophets really. Yeah. So and, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 There's there's different stages. You know, early Isaiah is kind of you know on the on the yeah. front end. Like maybe the Northern Kingdom has started. If you've to read fall. the Book of Daniel, that's like, that's right at the beginning of the exile. Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar just is kind of coming right. in. And so yeah. and Persia is one of the empires that takes over during Daniel's reign. Yep. Um, and so I Esther, said Syria, and I should say Persia. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so and that's at the very end of the Book of Daniel. So. Esther happens after chronologically the book of Daniel. Right, which and 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 something to note here is if you've read Daniel and you've read Jeremiah, even if you haven't, this will be helpful to know. There was this promise that that this exile would last 70 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is 70 years have passed. Yeah. And and be, and that's because it wasn't meant to be a chronological 70 years yeah, of exile. Yeah, Daniel reads the book of Jeremiah and he's yep. like, 70 years have passed, Lord. I've been in Babylon for 70 years. Are you coming back? Yep. And then God tells Daniel, "No." 490 years. Yeah, it's going to be a lot longer. Se well, he's a 70 times 7. 70 times 7. Yep. Meaning like the completion of the rest must occur. The completion yep. of exile must yep. occur. Like you were so disobedient, the land must lay fallow for a proportionate amount of time. Mm -hmm. The land must rest from your presence for a proportional yep. amount of time before you can return. Yep. So Esther is situated in that period of exile, suffering, mm -hmm. disobedient punishment. Yep. Uh, and Esther is in Persia. Yep, and Mordecai, and we'll and we'll yeah. read about a time after Esther, right? With with Ezra and Nehemiah, mm -hmm. right? They come after Esther. Yep. Is that right? When they yes. when they yes, are they sent do. by another Persian king to go rebuild the temple yeah, and yeah. to go back into the land of Jerusalem. So she's kind of situated between Daniel and Ezra and Nehemiah. Is that a good way to think about it? Yes. Okay, great. If, if you are familiar with those books, that's a great way. To oh think yeah, about sure. <laughs> <laughs> All you should know. Long story short is Israel disobeyed. Yep. They were taken. God sent the nations of Assyria and Babylon to destroy Israel and mm -hmm. displace most of its population. Israel, the people of God, have been scattered throughout the world. And there are small pockets yes. of the people of God throughout these various superpowers that control the world. That's right. Some Persia. are in Persia, some are in Babylon, some are in Assyria, they're, right. some are in Egypt. They're all over the place. And there's this consecrated, uh, concentrated, like... Uh, um, like people, like, yeah. it, like population of Jewish people living in the capital city of Susa in Persia. Yes, and that's where our story takes place. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So this is where we are, and and there's a few things to to mention about exile um, that that are helpful when trying to understand the Book of Esther as a whole. Okay. Uh, one is the different pockets of people. I yeah. think that was really good to see because these this edict will go out, and um, like they send this edict out to all the corners of. The territory to kill. Yeah, it says that he, uh, the king, oversees 127 provinces. Mm -hmm. and it's multiple languages, multiple like governors, and so every time things happened. Yep, you have to s disseminate information widely right. and in yeah. multiple languages. And so the people of God are spread out through all of Persia's kingdom, right. not just in the capital city. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing that is very, very unique to the Book of Esther that I think exile helps give us a framework for is the fact that God is not mentioned. In the it book is of Esther. fascinating. We have a book of the Bible that is in the canon of Scripture that God does is, not have the word God in it. Like He's never mentioned. God's not mentioned. He is hauntingly absent, it seems. Yeah, yeah. 
And I think what's helpful is for us to understand that in 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 the in the in the Old Testament mindset, but also in the Hebrew mind, that um, proximity to Jerusalem and like being in the promised land was being near God. And like those two things go hand in hand. Right. So to be far from Jerusalem, be outside of the land, is to be absent from God. That's right. And so the fact that God's name is not in this exilic book makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's making like uh, a, a poetic point, mm-hmm. like based on like scriptural principles. The yep. idea is like when you're far from Jerusalem, you're far from God's presence and power. So God's never mentioned. Right. Um, and I think for as modern readers or as a non-believer coming to read the book, it's actually kind of a powerful apologetic as mm-hmm. well. Like you experience or you assume the world is not run by God. Yeah, you, you assume it works one way. You assume the world works one way. You yeah. assume that all the the actions of powerful men and the viruses that are going around the world and everything, it's just, it's just chaos. It, it happens, and it's all happenstance, and if you play your cards right and you get lucky, things might go your way, but they might not. Yeah, and you can read the story of Esther that way. You could. You can read the story of Esther, and you can say, wow, these people were interesting people for their time yep. who accomplished some good things they for their, out their, their people, times. and they were able to use their political savvy to yep. pull it off. Right. But. Yeah, but <laughs> there are far too many coincidences, you know, if you would, there that, you know, that things just, just so happen to yeah. happen. Well, maybe before we go to the coincidences, yeah. so think about this. So you, you mentioned it already. There is, uh, this book is in the canon of scripture. Mm-hmm. So you have a book that never mentions God in a book about the revelation of God. Mm. So one of the, I was reading a co- commentator, her name is uh, Karen Jobes. Mm-hmm. She's a great author, yeah. um, and I've read multiple of her things. And she mentions the fact that the, actually the only way that you know God, one of the ways that you know God is present in the book of Esther is because it's in God's revelation. Mm. It's because it's in the canon of scripture. And without the help of other scripture, yeah. we actually wouldn't know that God is present in the book of Esther, mm. um, which I thought was super fascinating yeah um so the point there is yeah. that um what was my point i was making <laughs> <laughs> I was like i lost like i lost my own train of thought that's awesome uh, i think it is one good way yeah. to think about it is like it's positioning the canon being in the bible is another way to, to for us to know that god is at that's work, exactly right. right so it's inviting you to say okay it can't be right that god isn't here right because this is in the book about yeah. god's actions in the world particularly when it doesn't seem like he's yeah. there. That is external evidence coming to bear upon the internal content of Esther. Yes. But I think there are also internal evidences there is. of God's operation in That's this That's exactly book. right. So I think what that's supposed to tell us is if you're looking at your life right now and saying, God's nowhere to be found. Mm-hmm. My life is out of control. I'm controlled by people and forces more powerfully than, powerful than me. Mm-hmm. I Every time I try to exercise some self-determination, it seems to go wrong. I can't seem to make any traction in this area of my life or that area of my life. I always seem to be sick and suffering. My friends always seem to be losing their jobs. The economy seems to be tanking. You're looking at life the way the book of Esther describes it. Mm. It's like, it seems chaotic. Yeah. It seems like God is not present. Right. But the fact that the book of Esther is in God's canon of scripture should tell you that it's not all like it seems. Right. Yep. There is a God behind the scenes because the book itself is in God's revelation. Like yeah. This is, God is revealing himself in the minutia, in the injustice, in the reversals, in the coincidences, yep. in the strange things that happen yep. in your life, and even in the pa- halls of power. Yeah, and I think that's the point I would want to double down on here is that... Um, that, that is the different picture of God we get in the book of Esther that's so important, I think, for us, especially as modern believers, to see is that the book of Esther gets to show us the God behind the scenes. Yes. Because, like, what we've seen in the Bible so far, you know, in, like, the Torah and stuff, mm-hmm. was, like, a God who sends plagues and speaks directly to Moses and shows up in a burning bush. And, you know, yeah, and it's yeah, like... Yeah. That's the kind of God we've seen, one that speaks with thunder and lightning yeah, and yeah. manifests himself in theophanies and physical presence and, yep. and shining glory. Pillars of cloud yeah. and pillars of fire. It's yeah. like he fills the tabernacle. And it's like a lot of us cannot connect with that kind of a manifestation of God. And we're like, yeah, sure, if I saw that. Our whole world like, looks like the book of Esther. Yes. But like our, our day-to-day life is 
is just like, where's God? It seems random. I think he might be there. Maybe he's working something out. I don't know. The Bible really tells me he should be here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I don't see that reality. And neither would the people in exile. Yeah. Like they are living apart from God, wondering, is God working everything that seems so awful? Is he behind the scenes doing something or are we actually alone? And I yeah. think the book of Esther comes to exiles who don't know that God is actively working and says to them, even when you can't see him, God is working. Yes. Like, Despite exactly what it looks like, God is in control. I yeah. think that was the that through was the line. through line for Daniel. I think it's a really good through line for Esther too. Despite what it looks like, mm-hmm. God really is in control. Yep. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think one of the things we see God's control in is his um, is this like the 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 foil of the king. Yes. So like so you have this king Ahasuerus. So let's let I me. Mean, yeah. So this is us getting into the, yeah, let's the, get into the text. Book. So we, we so meet the first this king. chapter yep. introduces this really powerful king. Yeah, he's the yeah he's the king of Persia. Ahasuerus uh, mm-hmm. is how the ESV translates it. But this is King Xerxes. Yep. Uh, but more importantly, uh, at the end of the book, uh, there's this letter to Mor- that Mordecai writes, and he just references him as the king. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's because Mordecai takes his name out of it, even though like. If you're sending the king's edict, it should be like from the capital city of Persia, yeah. from the hand of King Xerxes. Yeah, yeah. He just says the king. So what you're referring to at the very end of the, the book, very end of the book, there's yep. an edict that goes out to all the people to uh, all the Jews to celebrate the feast of Purim. Right. And Mordecai's writing this edict, and instead of saying King Xerxes yep. did all this, he just says the king yes. did all this. Yes. And that is, I think. It's a clue. A be- and he's a believer. He's yeah. a Jew. Like, he's part of God's covenant people. And that's his way of saying, I know who's actually in control. Yes. The king has declared this edict. Yes. And I think that is, we're supposed to see in the king, in his failures, mm-hmm. and in some of his, like, representations and the way he's yeah. described, we're supposed to see um, contrasts and similarities yeah. with Yahweh. Yeah. And, yeah. You could even, like, picture him. So in a world that doesn't seem like, God's God exists or God's active, you do have people trying to take that position. Yep. And so King Xerxes acts like God. Mm-hmm. Yep. His laws cannot be changed. That's right. His kingdom covers the known world. His um, he's described with the same language used in the rest of the Bible, only ever used to describe God. That's right. When you come into his presence uh-huh. and you experience his wrath, yep. when you experience, you pray to him, like there's yeah, some languages yeah, here. That, yeah. like, when Esther goes and petitions him later, those words are used for God whenever we yeah. come and petition him in prayer, like in Psalms and things. It yeah. talks about his glory. Yep. Um, and so, and even like in the first chapter, mm-hmm. it goes into like really explicit detail about how beautiful his palace is. Yes, and some of the things it talks about, the the, the curtains, the colors, the cloth, are all temple language. This is like the tabernacle again. Yes. And we're told that like there's this inner court that the king dwells inside of, and if you go into that without being invited, you die. Like this should remind us of Leviticus. Yes. Like this is like he is setting up, like Esther is setting up the king yes. as a foil against which we should understand Yahweh. In a world that looks like God's not in control, yep. and that God's not present, there's always going to be a king mm-hmm. and a kingdom that presumes itself to be God. Right. It presumes itself to be the final determiner, the final power, and the mm-hmm. final say-so in the land. Right. So this goes back to another important way that we need to read the book of Esther. Is like the book of Esther is meant for people beyond the Jews living in Susa mm-hmm. when King Xerxes was in power. Like it, it, This is meant for a broader audience. And we should be seeing not just the Israel salvation, but all of our salvation mm. in this story. So I think what we're going to try to do through this podcast more and more is try to give you a category for thinking about these characters. Mm. It's not just King Xerxes. Right. He's the king of the world. Yes. It's not just uh, the kingdom of Persia. Yep. It's, it's the kingdom of darkness. It's every evil kingdom. It's every evil kingdom. Yes. It's not just Israel. Yep. It's all God's people everywhere. Throughout all generations. Throughout. God's chosen people. Yep. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely right. Um, I think that that is what the book of Esther is trying to do, is to set up almost eternal categories yes. for us through all of these different characters. Yeah. And we'll get into a few of those. Uh, that was yeah. I'm really excited. Uh, before we leave the con- the concept of the king, okay, okay, okay. Uh, and, and, and like trying to show that God's people, that to show, trying to show God's covenant people that God is still in control. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just interesting how the king is always shown to be kind of this puppet. 
that yeah, he, he never can, makes any decisions by himself. Yeah, he's he's like always drunk. Yep, and he always listens to whatever anybody the yep. person closest to him suggests. Yep, and so yeah. like yeah, so like uh, Haman will come in later and be like, hey, you should kill all the Jews. And you're and like, okay, yeah, yeah. sure. Here's an edict. Well, in the very first pages, like everyone tells him to make an edict about all women in his kingdom. He makes the edict That's when he's right. drunk. Haman comes when he's drunk to like make this other edict. Yep. So he makes the, the edict then. Even when Esther comes and makes her plea to save the Jews, he's drunk. Yeah. Like and he and he just does it. Yeah. Like, and he, he, like which <laughs> is directly contradicting himself. Yes. And so he's just this puppet king. And like I think what we're what God is trying to show his people and all people is that this is every king to me. No mm. matter how powerful the king is, no matter how yeah. expansive his empire, I whisper in his ear and he does what I say. Yeah. Like that is God's control over every kingdom. Yeah. Like, and he can use tiny little Esther or wicked Haman. You know, he yeah. can use anybody, but ultimately he sits on the highest throne and moves kingdoms and kings wherever he wants. I think yeah. that is what we're supposed to see in the bumbling malleability of this king of Persia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I think that's super helpful. So as you prepare yourself to read the book of Esther, like try to put yourself in like the imaginative shoes like that we're offering you. Like we live in a king. We live in a kingdom mm -hmm. ruled by a king who thinks his way should be law. His way should be God's way. Like yep. His way is God's yep. way. Mm -hmm. The way that he thinks about the world, the way that he structures his government, the decisions that he makes are unchangeable, infallible, that everyone should bow to him. Mm -hmm. That king exists in every presidential office, yep. every prime minister, every chairman's office throughout the globe. There are, and even not politically, maybe just culturally, or even like spiritually and demonically, like yep. we'll get to some of that, that in the book of Esther too. Mm -hmm. But there are kings who assume they are God, mm -hmm. and we live in their kingdom. Yep. And as people who, like Esther and Mordecai, are the people of God in the kingdom of the, the, of the evil king, mm -hmm. how do we live? How do we live... When it seems like God's not on the, on the throne, right? But Xerxes is. Yeah. When the evil one is, is on the throne, how do we live in that tension? Yeah. And that's what the Book of Esther is inviting us to see. So let's get into the story. Yeah. So after there's this grand banquet at the, the king is getting drunk at, yeah. it's kind of a crazy party. It goes for I think 187 180 days, and then there's a seven day oh. capstone to oh, it. Oh great, great. <laughs> they needed that after 180 days of partying. You know what I want. Seven more days of partying. Seven more days of partying. <laughs> uh, and it's supposed to, that's supposed to communicate to you just the level of like opulence, mm -hmm. wastefulness, uh, self indulgence yep. that uh, this king and this kingdom right. represents. Because what does the edict say that he sends out to everyone? There's only one rule at the party. There is no compulsion. And what does that mean? It means, it kind of, kind of sounded like the opposite, but it basically means. Do whatever you want. There are no rules. The there, only rule is that there are no rules. The only rule is everything's to yours yeah. to eat. Like Which did, have you ever? Did you ever see Three Hundred? I did see Three Hundred. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the movie, and like Xerxes is in it. That's right. He is. And he's like this a, tall, golden, yeah, yeah, yeah. king. And like, it, there's a scene that shows the parties that he used to throw. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So he was famous, even in Hollywood culture. They picked right, up right, on right. this. That Xerxes threw these nasty. Gross, gross, orgy, drunken parties. Yes. Yeah. So you're supposed to see a kingdom ruled by hedonism, hedonism, and by like aesthetics. Like they're the part of the yep. reason. Like it's like all about beauty. It's all surface level. Yeah, their floor is made of things that normally would go on like a ring, like a mother of pearl. Oh, they just walk on that stuff. Yeah. It's just this opulent, over the top, self indulgent, uh, kind of yeah, self indulgent party right which like should it was just a great way to cue us in today as as like when you see kingdoms flexing like this yeah know that this is evil yes like whenever you have leaders and kings and rulers talking about how great they are and and how much wealth they have and and building great buildings and talk like <laughs> feels yeah 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 it's evidence it's evidence that we live in the kingdom yeah the kingdom of persia is an eternal kingdom yep and we still live in it. 
Yep. Our people, we as people are still, the people of God are still in that kingdom mm-hmm. and all the rules of the world are still taking their cues from the, 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 uh, the, the, Xerxes. King, the yeah. Xerxes. They're still yeah. taking, we still live in the kingdom. Yep. All of this is evidence that we haven't progressed beyond. It. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. exactly right. So during this, during this party, the, the king wants to show his wife off because she's apparently very beautiful. So again, what's, what's being showed off there? The beauty, the opulence. Oh, like, right. Like there's yep, just same like, thing. there's like this, pr- like, uh, preference for shallow beauty mm. once again like how much of our culture is still a part of this kingdom beauty shallowness parading women around is Oof. still like a yeah. central part of life in the kingdom yep. it was then it is now yeah so she he says come out and show your brute beauty in front of all my drunk men yeah and she's like no she goes, no and i'm like good for queen vashti <laughs> that's, Get what it, girl. <laughs> <laughs> that's how i feel about it um, and then it, and then he goes into a rage, which is like a classic move too for this story, where it's like this great king with all this opulence to show you know his yeah. party goers his wife's beauty, and, and his wife is just like no, and it just sends everything into a tailspin, it's which sh- is like a foreshadowing yeah, of what's yeah. going to happen with him and Esther. Yeah, he he is actually powerless. Yeah, he's powerless. His wife won't listen to him. Yeah, apparently he can make unchanging laws, but his <laughs> wife won't listen. To him. And I mean, again, it's not a good thing. <laughs> But it's point. It's proves the point. Yeah. Anyway, so she won't come. He flies into a rage. Yep. And all of his counselor, he banishes the queen. Mm-hmm. And all of his counselors come to him and say, "Hey, if uh, news of this is going to get out, and if news of this gets out, none of the women in the kingdom are going to listen to their husbands. Right. You should tell all women to uh, bow down to their husbands right. and honor them the way that." Queen Vashti should should have, have should have honored you. Yeah. And he's like, "That's a great idea." Yeah. And he signs it off, but. Nobody would have known about it. No. He if, just he just aired his own dirty laundry yes. into the whole kingdom. There was all the governors of his kingdom that would have been there. Yep. So maybe there's something to be said for like, hey, make an example of Vashti for your governors. Yep. No one here. But what he did by making an edict to all lands in all languages to all people just exploded the problem that he had yeah. in the first place. Everybody knows that the king is not listened to by his own Was wife. Was humiliated by his wife. Yes. Yeah. It's hilarious. Fascinating. It is yeah. fascinating. It's an ironic. Well, we'll talk about irony a good yeah. bit in here, but it's, yeah. it's an uh, it's an ironic like moment where mm-hmm. like the king who has all power when he wants just to displayed use that himself power. as powerless to his kingdom. Yes. Yeah. It's yes. hilarious. So yeah. uh, in that, the king finds out that he's lonely because he doesn't have a wife anymore. Uh, he doesn't have a queen anymore. <laughs> right. Um, and his counselors come to him again and say, hey, I have an idea. Like We can collect for you all of <laughs> I just thought of how his 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 court like yeah, gui- yeah. guides are like the, the dude in the romantic comedy. He's like, let's get you a rebound, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, dude, there's so many fish in the pond. <laughs> like, they're just like the classic romantic comedy <laughs> rebound guys. Yes, and they come to him and they say, here's a great... Except- here they're a little more brutal oh, than the yeah. rebound guys because the rebound guys well, let's just go trolling for girls in bars. Here let's kidnap all the beautiful oh women my in gosh, the kingdom. So, intense. so they say, "Hey, king, you don't you need a wife? Yep. What if we go and collect all the beautiful virgins from all your kingdoms? You can sleep with each one of them successively, and then choose which one you prefer to be your king based on their sexual performance." So next up on the Bachelor, yeah. <laughs> So, so Esther brought to you by ABC. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So like yes. So a little, we literally have a TV show yeah. based on that similar pre- here in America premise called The with, Bachelor, where uh, a couple of women will sleep with one guy and he chooses his favorite yep. from among them. Now, watchers of The Bachelor would disagree with that statement. Yes, but all you need to say is that it's evidence we live in the kingdom. It is. It's just we like s- da- here, here we've gathered all the most beautiful, eligible bachelorettes from around the nation to come and date this one guy. Yeah, you give like even the opening night, he gives like this thing called the first impression rose. Yeah, yeah. And it's, well, who's the hottest? You know, like, here you go. Yeah, and, and then it, they have this thing at the end called the fantasy. And what's suite. in every one of those TV shows? Champagne. Yep. Beautiful everyone's locations. Yep. Everyone's going to like to Greece and to Florida. Yeah, right. Or the, the outback. Greece and Florida. <laughs> I don't know. All these beautiful places. Greece <laughs> and the <Florida>. Keys. <laughs> But like no offense to Florida, I love the Florida. opulence, yeah, the drinking, totally, the partying, the sex, the sex, yep. the facade of yep. beauty. Like we still live in the kingdom. We do. We still live in the kingdom. Yep. 
And so the people say, okay, and let's do this party. Let's yep. do this. Let's do this competition. Yep. And the king says, well, that's a great idea. Yeah. I would love to have sex with hundreds of women and then decide my favorite. Right. Uh, so the kingdom is brutal. It is very brutal. It's, it's not just brutal. superficial. Yep. It's not just funny. Yep. It's not as kind of stupid like it's The Bachelor horrific. is. horrific. It's grotesque. Yeah. Like it's authoritarian. Mm-hmm. It's... De- I, I'm, gonna try, I'm trying to think of words to describe a king who would kidnap the women from every region and then rape them yeah. to determine his determine yep. his next queen. Yep. I think it's important to lean in on that and use that language because I know when the story of Esther has been told and I've heard it told, it's like, and Esther came and she got to spend a year making herself beautiful and then she went before the king and did a runway show and then left. Yeah. No. Verse 8 of chapter 2 says Esther was taken. Mm -hmm. She was taken. She was kidnapped. This is forcible. She was given all this cosmetics. Yep. Uh, but and in like the word custody is used there, taken into the like the custody, like she was imprisoned, yeah, like into a brothel, yeah. So the king's this harem, is sex trafficking, yes, that's what this is. So she was invited into the king's harem, and a harem was essentially just a building where the king housed all his potential sexual mm-hmm. partners, normally for the use of like political power. Yep. So he would say, oh, I'll I'll bring your daughter here, and this like seals. I'll have sex with her. That seals our bond between yep. our two nations. And he wouldn't necessarily sleep with them again. It yep. acted to function like, like a prison for a lot of these women. Yep. Because they would come, sleep with the king once, be consigned to the harem, yep. and then live a lonely, exiled life in the king's harem. Yep. So her- And so- there were there were these two harems. Did you pick up did you pick up no, on no, that? No, I didn't. So like Esther is in this beauty prep school. Yeah. Comes in, is raped by the king, mm-hmm. and then she goes to a second harem, it says. Fascinating. And like that's her retaining cell. And it says, after it says the second harem, until she is called back by name by the king, which right. probably wouldn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 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 grotesque. It's horrible. And again, let's make another modern parallel here. The fact that we still live in the kingdom. Like we don't have the resource. Most people don't have the resources to house 500 sexual partners mm. and then choose whichever one they want. But we do have cell phones. And our harems are just digital now. Yep. Like like pornography yep. is our modern version of the digit of a harem. Yep. We still live in the kingdom. Mm-hmm. Like we are not have not escaped uh the world that right. Esther is describing. Or, thing, or things like Tinder. Yeah. Yeah. It's like no, no, based on physical no, oh yes, I'm no. sleep with you. Okay, next. Yes. You know, and like we just still live in this in this kingdom. Yeah. yeah. We, yeah. we could see the evidence for it everywhere. Yeah. Um so then we're introduced. So we, we kind of basically said Esther is one of these women. Yeah, Esther gets taken and she is one of the people of God. She's a yeah. Jew and she her parents have died previous to this. She was adopted by her uncle Mordecai. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is kind of fascinating. It takes us so long to get to the title character of yeah. the, the book, but here they are. Yep. Um, do you, why, is it, why does it take so long? That's a good. It's a good question. I think it's because the emphasis of the story is on kingdom, not necessarily Esther. Mm. And so, yeah, it's the title character of the book. But I think we're meant to be couching this whole thing in the idea of kings and kingdoms. Fascinating. And, and not necessarily in the that's, bravery of a of a woman. Now, like like, like you said at the beginning, that's part of it. I don't want to downplay right that role, especially the main of her as point intercessor. Is, but really, in the story, she's not the main character. She's not. More, really, the main battle is between what we'll see in chapter three between Mordecai and Haman. We'll yeah. get there, but I think it starts with the kingdom because that is the setting and the overall purpose yeah. of this book is to show us who moves kingdoms, who's in charge, yeah. who will save when God's everything people. Everything looks like God's not visible. Yeah. is God still there? Yep. like that's the point the yes. book is asking, and that's why he spends so much time opening up on the opulence of a kingdom and then focusing on the. Um, like the stupidity yeah. of this king. Because yeah. like, these are the kings you want to trust in? These are the kings you think while you're in exile are really in control? These yeah. bumbling idiots? Yeah. Of course not. Like, yeah. And so I think that's why okay. we, we, we spend so much time before we get to Esther. And so she's, invi- she's invited. <laughs> she's <laughs> no. kidnapped into this beauty pageant. And so here's a really interesting mm. moment for Esther. Mm. So like, we, I mean, this is, this is grotesque. Yeah. This is awful. But she's powerless to do anything. Mm. So what do you do as a person of God when the culture demands from you superficial beauty, sexual prowess, 
And in her case, maybe less so in ours, but like, she, like she's being forced to perform sexually for her her survival, or yep. like, like she's it's going to happen. Yep. So she's in this kind of awful situ- situation. Does she resist the king when she spends her night with him, or does she try her hardest to please the king? Right. In order to gain favor. In order to gain favor. Right. Uh, oh, which is, but there's, and, but it, 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 this is a gray. Okay. It's this. Uh, this book has a lot of gray areas to so it. That's probably good to name right here. Yeah, because um, we don't need to try to morally reconcile Esther in this story, because she is not meant to be a moral uh, paradigm that we live up to. So what you're saying there is, I've heard, I've heard versions of the Book of Esther. People preach and say. Esther is the paragon of godliness. Mm. I've also heard versions of the story of Esther. Esther is a terrible person. Yeah, no. She does. She hides the fact that she's Jewish. She h- doesn't keep into the kosher laws. She's apparently great in bed. Yep. Like she's a morally compromised human. Right. And what you're saying is like actually you're not meant to make that judgment no, at the, all. The, the right interpretation, I think, and what I think a lot of people we've been reading have been saying is the the best way to understand Esther is to let both of those things stand on opposite mm. sides and live in the tension between the two. Because this whole book is tension. Yeah. And the whole book is irony and reversal. And so we don't need to go like, no, Esther was, she did this again. She didn't want to do this. And like, right, right, right. It's like no, let's, we don't need to go that far to try to, to make her, you know, like morally pure, perfect. Right. Neither do we need to say, yeah, she compromised everything and gave it up. And she's this worldly, you know, whore, you right. know, and like, no, like there's good and bad. Right. And we and it's not our job and it's not what the book of Esther is trying to show us to find which is good and bad. Because the point isn't be like Esther no. or be like Mordecai. It's right. it's who's who which king does Who's in control? Who's in control? Yeah. Whose kingdom do you align yourself yes. with? And at this point it seems as if Esther has aligned herself with the kingdom of Xerxes. That's right. The kingdom of the world. Yep. She in all intents and purposes, is a product of the kingdom. She's beautiful. Yep. She's good in bed. Yep. She has all the opulence of the the fine oils mm-hmm. and myrrhs and yep. well dressedness. Morde- Mordecai told her not to reveal the fact that she was Jewish to just try to be Persian. She's more beautiful than Vashti. Apparently, like yeah. all the like shallowness of chapter one is now on her. Is on her. Yeah. She's a product of the kingdom. Yeah. And I bet you almost anything you ask any woman who alive today they will feel the pressure to be like the kingdom. Mm-hmm. Whatever beauty standards, whatever yep. dress standards, whatever sexual expectations are placed yeah. like on uh, people in the kingdom in Xerxes' day are still placed on women today. Yes. Like there is not only double standards, but like mm. sexist, misogynistic standards which yep. women are held to yep. that they're all constantly being asked, will you be a product of the kingdom? Will you conform to its ways? Or we consider a different way. Mm. And so all we know about Esther at this point, though, is that she seems to be a product of the kingdom. Right. Even her name, yes. Esther. Yes. Uh, so her, her her Jewish name is uh, Hadassah. Uh-huh. Which I think it means like myrtle or something. Okay. It's like a tree. Yeah. Uh, but her Persian name is yep. Esther. Yep. Which is like the Persian god Isthar. Yes. So yeah, it sounds just like it's it's the same name. Ishtar Estar. Yeah. It's, it's like it's a very yeah. similar like she is a product of the Persian gods. Yep. And her uncle, his Persian name is Mordecai. Which apparently so I thought Mordecai was always a Jewish oh, name. Oh no, sorry. Yeah, but it's it has this it has this uh Persian referent. Yeah. So Mordecai is his name, but it sounds an awful lot like Marduk. Right. And I think it's even like Mordecai's a perversion of the original Hebrew to yep. make it sound, sound more, more like, like Marduk. Persian, which is like even in his name. And Marduk's he's another co- oh, sorry, yeah, Marduk yeah, is, is like the consummate Babylonian god. Yeah. And so, like like he is Marduk's the heavy hitter. Yeah. And so like Mordecai, even his name is some kind of weird cultural blending of Israel and Persia. Yeah. Which is like the opposite of what the entire biblical narrative was hoping for God's people. Right, there's all these emphasis on don't intermarry, don't intermarry, yeah. intermarry don't with worship their people. gods. And now you your your name has been changed to sound like another god. You yeah. intermarried, so you're culturally compromised, and now you're religiously compromised because you sound like this other god. So you have a situation where like you're intractably connected to the kingdom. Yeah, and I would I would guess that all of us feel this way. Mm. Like if we were try to like. We, how do you separate the people of God from the kingdom that we yeah. live in right now? Like, as a human being in the 21st century living in America, like, I actually can't pull out of myself all the ways that I'm culturally mm-hmm. American 
from the ways that I'm culturally biblical. Yeah. You know, or I'm a part of the people of God. My right. identity as a Christian in Christ always seemed to be so intermixed yep. with American idolatries, uh, Western idolatries, right. liberal idolatries, what conservative idolatries that like I don't know how to pull apart right. The two halves of myself. Yeah, to be in the world and of the world is far harder than that verse makes it sound. Yes. And yeah. so we have pictures of what that means. Like these people are intricately connected in the kingdom, mm-hmm. yet somehow also part of the people of God. Right. Um, and so let's switch. Let's well, wait, I think it's just interesting to, I think I think seeing Isthar and Marduk in Esther and Mordecai uh, is also another um, way that God is trying to show us in the book of Esther um, what's, what's the main point. Yeah. And it is that these false gods, Isthar and Marduk, are going to be the downfall of, or, or even like end up being in control of the kingdom of Persia, because Esther and Mordecai mm. are end up going are, are are going to end up like being the ones who seal the edicts and make the policies and turn the the heart the the king the the heart of the king. What you're saying is that the nations that sent. Israel in exile, Persia, mm-hmm. Babylon, Assyria. Assyria. They had these gods that were in control of those yep. kingdoms. And Marduk, they, yep, Marduk, Ishtar, yep. uh, Baal, Baal, and they thought Tiamat. that it was because of their gods that they were able to overpower Yahweh. So they, two people of God, come in. They rename them mm-hmm. based off of their presuppositions about who's in charge. Yep, trying to say like, look, our gods have overshadowed your Yahweh God. So you, yeah. you won't be Joshua, like you know, yeah. Yahweh saves. You know, Yeshua, Yahweh saves. You won't be symbols of God's provision or yeah. whatever. You'll be symbols of our conquest over you. That's right. Our gods have beaten your God, so we're renaming you. And so right. the fact that those God, those so Esther and Mordecai, Ishtar and Marduk rise up into Babylon and save God's people. That's right. Is a total reversal. God is saying, "I am in charge, not these false gods." And I'll right. prove it to you. I'll use your own gods to topple your own kingdom. Fascinating. Like that is. So I think even the whole point is to show that this is, like we've said before, huge cosmic conceptual categories to show a major battle between good and evil, God mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Satan, that's happening yeah. here. And nowhere does that seem more clearly than in chapter 3. Yes. Right? We should name also, just before we move to mm-hmm. chapter 3, Mordecai is uh, Esther's adoptive father. Yes. He also encourages Esther to submit to the king's beauty pageant. Right. He doesn't resist no. um, the kidnapping. I don't even know if he could. I don't know if he could either. But, but we're like, told that... He encouraged her to go. Yeah, That's exactly so, yeah. right. Um, and then Mordecai uh, is placed in the king's uh, palace. So he is outside the king's palace, and he operates as a temple guard, basically. Yep. So like he's kind of like a new Levite, which is very interesting. I didn't think about that. You know, because it was part of the job of some of the tribes of Levi to stand around the tabernacle mm-hmm. to guard it. So if we have this inner holy of holies with all its opulence and its curtains and its fine twined linen and its stones in the middle, and then you have this temple court outside... And Mordecai is to guard it. And we know he does this because uh, later uh, he hears of a plot to overthrow the king and he ends up revealing it to the king and, yeah, and saving he, o- he operates as the guard. Yeah. So that's his job is temple yeah. guard. So not only is he a, a assimilated into the kingdom, he is part of the infrastructure of guarding the kingdom. Yes. Like he is integrated into this thing. Yes. And so where is where does it say that he is from Kish and he oh, is Oh, it's it's somewhere in two and three. So so yeah. so okay. So let's go back to this like intricately connected. Yes. He's guarding the presence of the king of the world. And he is responsible for protecting him, providing for him. But at the same time, he's also identified as from the tribe of Benjamin. And from the man named Kish. Now that sounds like oh, that's just a weird random random fact about Mordecai. Wrong. Yeah. Super super wrong. Super important. Yeah. Benjamin and Kish were the descent King Saul. King Saul. They were descendants of King Saul. He was a descendant of King Saul. King Saul was the first, first. king of Israel. Yeah. And he was from the tribe of Benjamin. So by including this fact here, what it's cluing us into is not only is he kind of this intertwined person of God with the with the kingdom of the world, he also represents the kingly line of God's people. Mm-hmm. He's supposed to rule and reign God's kingdom. Like that's that that's his lineage. That's what he was supposed to do, but he's not doing that. That's right. Until. Yeah, Haman. until chapter three when we meet this this Haman. So time is fast forwarded, right? We've we've yeah. jumped ahead 
oh, over a year. Yeah, a good, a good, good chunk of time. Yeah, mm-hmm. and now there is this man named Haman, and the first thing we're told about uh-huh. him is that he is an Agagite. Yep, which may again not mean anything to you, but King Saul was commanded by God to go and kill King Agag. Agag, Agag yeah, from the leader of the, the Amalekites. Amal- the Am- yeah, the Amalekites. Yep. Saul yep. disobeyed. Yep. <laughs> he allowed King Agag to live. Mm-hmm. And he went on and had his own people. And they, that nation stopped being called the Amalekites and started being called the Agagites. Yep. So the failure of King Saul to crush the kingdom of Agag is now coming back full circle in a yep. in an irony, yep. like this reverse reversing irony. And the kingdom of Agag will now rule be in over conflict. the people of Israel. Israel. Is, he's second in command yep. and he now rules over the people yep. of God. Which this is and this reversal is a repeat of the reversal that happens in the promised land to begin with. Like in back in back in the Torah, God says, Go in, you're gonna completely destroy the Canaanites and the Parasites. You know, the Parasites. Yeah, the parasites. Yeah, I always like the parasites. parasites. <laughs> but um and you're gonna you're gonna do this and, and if you don't, they will be a thorn in your flesh. Mm-hmm. Right? And like and there will yep. be this reversal. They will rule over you and you will worship their gods. Yes. All of this is happening now. Yes. Yeah, exactly right. So Haman steps into his position of power as the vizier of mm-hmm. uh, Persia, right. second in command of Persia, and he demands that all of his subordinates bow down to him. Yep. Mordecai refuses to, not simply because he doesn't like Haman, yep. but because Haman represents an ancient battle between the people of God and the, the evil, enemies of God, the enemy, the evil empire of the world, yeah. the empire. And so he's like, I refuse to repeat the sins of my father mm. that caused the situation in the first place. Haman kind of overreacts and said, I'm not just going to kill Mordecai. That's right. I want to kill all Jews everywhere. Right. Which is a huge overreaction, but it again points to a larger battle. This is not about Mordecai versus Haman. No. This is about the empire versus the people of God. That's right. And Haman and Mordecai are acting as... uh, Representative heads. Representative heads for this cosmic battle that's always been going on. Which should take us all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Which is there is going to be enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, which is what God said um, after the curse. And And that's the battle that takes place between Cain and Abel. Between Jacob and Esau, yep, right between and between their descendants as they as they go in, like you know, uh, Ham's Ham's descendant, you know, yeah. from one of one of son, uh, Noah's sons that was cursed is Canaan, yeah, and and but then one of his sons that he blessed, his descendants are the people of Abraham and the people of Israel. They have this big battle later yeah. on, like that's what the conquest of Canaan is, and so like over and over and over again throughout the biblical narrative, it's the story of God's people fighting God's enemies between the seed of the serpent, the servants of evil versus the servants of good and God's yeah. chosen ones, like fighting it yeah. out. So this is a cosmic battle happening in the book of Esther. And the definition of life in exile. So it's so like looping mm-hmm. back around, like, like we're kind of just like trying to unpack the fact that they're in exile. In exile, away from God's promised land, we will always be in conflict. Well, I mean, even in the promised land, mm. um, but we'll always be in conflict with the empires of the world. Right. There is always going to be an ongoing conflict between the people of God and the empire of the world when we are not with God. Yeah. They, like this is this is the way it will always yeah, when God's turn name up. isn't mentioned. When God's name isn't mentioned, <laughs> we will always find ourselves at odds yeah. with the world around us. Right. And so that's what's happening here between the story uh, and this is really just setting the setting the stage. So, and and you have this you have this edict. I just want to say it again mm-hmm. that goes out um, that all Jews. So Haman throughout all the yeah, kingdom, he wants to kill everybody, and so he wants to put it into law. So yes. Like, and so in order to do that, he goes to King Xerxes, mm-hmm. gets him drunk, pays ten thousand pieces of silver. Yep. Uh, for the destruction of the representative head of the Jews. Yep. So I mean, like. A, that's Judas and, and Jesus. Yep. Ju- Judas paid silver yeah, or, and to like, kill. Yeah, and he says talents of silver, yeah. which 10,000 talents is also the number Jesus uses in the parable of the unmerciful servant, so, which is just interesting. So just keep these numbers and keep these <laughs> ideas in your mind. And the king drunk, yep. the most powerful. Yeah, okay. like, sure, dude, that sounds great. Yep. Uh, and which is like, like, think about this. If you are an Israelite in exile... And you're thinking that the king of Persia is in charge and maybe even a foil against which you're supposed to see Yahweh. Doesn't this feel like how things actually are? It seems mm-hmm. like, 
our enemies, the Agagites and the Canaanites yeah. and Babylon, they just came to God and he was drunk and yeah, he yeah, just yeah. was like, yeah, sure, whatever, do whatever you want. I don't care. Yeah. And God is going to show throughout mm-hmm. Esther that that is not who he is. Yeah. He is not some dispassionate, drunk, aloof, flippant king that can be malleably yeah, moved yeah. anywhere he wants. He has a plan for his people and will be faithful. And look how it undermines even our ideas that like the king is actually in charge. Mm. No, the Persia is not what's the primary actor here. It's the empire of the world. Yep. This ancient battle mm-hmm. between the Agagites and the people of God mm-hmm. is actually the one defining all the terms in right. this story. It's not so much about Persia and the, their empire and whatever else. It's about this ancient conflict between the people of God and the people of the empire. And, and so I think even today we can get really lost and say, no, 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 it's actually about the, it's about the liberals being liberal. And that's <laughs> right, the problem. Right, it's right. actually about the conservatives being conservative. No, the central like conflict in all nations, at all times, that live apart from the presence of God is the conflict between the empire and the people of God. And yes. those things are always, that is the defining conflict for all of political life in the world. Mm-hmm. That's the battle that's going on. Yep. We do not wrestle with flesh and blood. Right. We wrestle against principalities and powers and the rulers in this present age. Yep. The book of Esther is giving us a really vivid picture of what that looks like. Yep. Yes, Haman's a physical person in the story, but he represents a centuries ancient mm. battle between good and evil, the people of God and the people of the empire. Yeah. And he's showing like Xerxes isn't who you worry about. Mm. Worry about the evil one. Yeah. Don't worry about whoever's on the throne or in right. the White House. He can be moved however we need. Yeah. And he will be manipulated yeah. by the powers of darkness. Right. To, Maybe that's a good way to talk right. about it is like the power of darkness seen in Haman, the Agagite, mm-hmm. is like is like is a picture of Satan operating behind the thrones of this world. Yes. He's he's whispering, he's the consigliere whispering yeah, yeah. into the ear of the king, moving him wherever he wants. Right. And like what God but I think what Esther's trying to show us is what Psalm two shows us mm-hmm. that like God's actually in control of every throne. And yes. he's the one who moves the heart of the king. You know, yes. and like that's what we'll see in the reversal of all this. I think as an exilic Jew reading this book, the first three chapters, like, yep, this that, is what I expect. This is life. Everything's yeah. compromised. Everything's terrible. And our enemies are in control. Yes. And then God's going to use all of that dark weight mm-hmm. to then show this bright reversal yeah. at the end of the book and through and through the middle. So we'll, we'll get to that reversal next week. Yeah. But before we go... We need to do what is our the whole reason we exist <laughs> yeah. as spoken gospel, and let's kind of. We, I think th- this one just had a really tight thread on it, so yeah. I didn't want we didn't want to break it up. Let's kind of work back through and, and go. Okay, so in this dark empire, yes, and this puppet king and these horrific, flippant edicts, yep, and the people of God being oppressed in exile. How do we see, savor, and worship Jesus in these texts? Oh. <sighs> Before we get to the victory at the end, yeah, <laughs> like in exile, like, um, yeah. I mean, I think about how Jesus he he came he came in, in exile. He did not. Jesus did not rise up in Jerusalem. He rose up in Galilee, in Samaria, mm-hmm. like yeah. which is one of the oldest Nazareth and Nazareth and like, but like one of the oldest, most originally deposed kingdoms, like one of the first mm-hmm. kingdoms to fall in the northern kingdom's invasion like yeah like it wasn't like this last bastion of hope like the maccabees yeah. were trying to be in the intertestinal period when they were held up in yeah. you know in the temple that which is where we I don't get know any of that history Han- but well that's where we get hanukkah yeah. from is that whole idea yes and so uh jesus came as an exile and he came to exiles you know and under the oppression of, Rome. of a roman king of another the empire of still another. there yeah this is still the seed of the serpent like yeah. whether it was herod or caesar or Pilate, like the king was still on the throne and being animated by the evil one and the evil one came and whispered into the ear and said kill this jew fascinatingly and he was sold yeah and like and think about the irony even like in the fact that it is the Jewish people who are taking the place of Haman mm-hmm. when Jesus is being crucified. That's right. They're the ones whispering to Pilate, yep. kill yep. Mordecai. The assimilation kill, yeah. of Mordecai, Marduk, Esther, Isthar, yeah. the assimilation is complete. 
Yeah. They aren't some hybrid now. They are all in the even even the people of God without his help would have been doomed to be the empire. Yeah. Like and that's that's the that's the thing is like as the people of God, we didn't like luck out and are somehow better. Like we would have been the ones yeah. whispering in the king's ear and leading everything to evil too. I think if we're going to say like so how do, what is the good news here? Mm-hmm. Like, let's just talk about the bad news, too. Like, we live in the empire. Yes. This empire still exists. We still choose our partners based on their sexual prowess. Mm -hmm. We prefer self-indulgence to self-restraint. We prefer the shallowness of, of beauty that fades to, like, true, truly gorgeous things. Yeah. Like, we... We want the beautiful virgin. We don't want a 50-year-long marriage. Yep. Like, like, we, we are all like culturally compromised, and it feels, it feels can, bad. We, we can't we don't unentangle yeah. ourselves from the culture that we live in. We live in societies that are ruled by powers that are um, capricious mm-hmm. at best. At best. And, and malicious at worst. Malicious at worst, and regardless, are controlled by an ancient evil. That's right. Like there that, is still there is still an enemy of God whispering into the ear of the leaders of the empire. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly right. So what are the what is the good news for the people of God in all that? Yeah. It's and I think it's really simply at this stage of the story, it's that God has not forgotten you. Mm-hmm. He's actually written a book about you. Yeah. If you feel like your life is out of control and there's only injustice around you all the time and nothing seems to go right. God has written a book precisely for people surrounded by the empire. Mm. I keep thinking about Star Wars when I say the empire. I know. Yeah. I, was like, I think you're supposed to. Uh, yeah, I was like, yeah. yeah. So, but like, the, you, it's a good, it's a good, it's you can't, if you feel like you can't escape the clutches of the empire, the expectations that the empire has for women, mm. the expectation of the empire has for men and the way that they use power. I mean, think about the Me Too movement. Like, yeah. like all of this is like, this is all here. He demands his right. wife come out and parade his beauty and then wants to sexually abuse hundreds of women Ugh, yeah. to prove what about himself? Yeah. I don't know. But like we still live here. Yeah. Har- yeah. Harvey Weinstein is still here, you know? <laughs> like, And I think maybe at this point in the story is that God is with us in exile. Mm. He actually wrote a book describing a godless place and to show us that that's actually not the case. Mm-hmm. That this isn't just... America going crazy. This isn't just right. China going crazy. No. This isn't just wherever you, and, you are, you, wherever you are, being nuts. Yeah, the battle is actually far larger. Mm. This is what the Book of Revelation does. It takes people suffering in the yes. churches, in the seven churches, and kind of expands them and blows them up to these kind of crazy, like cosmic proportions. Yeah, now, now it's dragons and, and oceans and whatever yeah. else. But what that should do for people who are living in exile and feel like they're living in a godless place is like, okay. I'm not alone. Mm. There are other people suffering like me. And this isn't just an isolated incident. This is part of a global attack on the people of God. Yeah. And that cannot be overlooked by the God I claim to serve. Mm. Like that, like if it's bigger than this, yeah. that means there's other rebels. Right. If it's bigger than this, God knows what's happening. Mm-hmm. If it's bigger than this, um, we can still hope to overthrow the empire one day. Right. Like I think yeah. like maybe that's kind yeah, of going definitely. on in the scenes. I definitely think so. Cuz uh, it's like yeah. if it's just one village on on an outpost on Jakku oh, like right. <laughs> some 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 Star, Star Wars, Wars ref. Like if you if you're just being like like so that guy Ray who Ray sells all those like spare spaceship oh, parts yeah, to that, that guy. big guy. Yeah, he's like like one quarter portion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like if that's if that's what you think it is. Yeah. Man, it can be feel really hopeless. You can feel alone. But, but if you it, knew that this is this has been the cosmic battle happening since the beginning of the fall, and that it has continued, manifests itself in every single kingdom on every corner of the and globe. And there seems to somehow, in some ways, be people of God in the highest places of yes, power. Right. Yeah. Man, what's yep. going to happen? Yeah. And that God, and like that God has His people there in those kingdoms and places them there, um, and does so in order to not to overthrow Xerxes. Right. But, but to, to overthrow to, the evil one. To overthrow evil itself. Yes. Yeah. And I think like that is the good news of Jesus' is coming. Yeah. Is that we that like what I what I love about the gospel is that in a world where our everyday experiences tell us 
that the word God is not in our story. Mm-hmm. Like God yeah, is yeah. absent from our story. Um, we get to look to the gospel story and see that not only is God in control, God is in the flesh. And yeah. God has come into evil empires and has identified with us in our exile, has come to us in our exile. And in the Gospels, you see him starting in Galilee and then making his way into Jerusalem. And he comes into Jerusalem and he's bringing his disciples with him. He's bringing followers with him. He's bringing a train of people yeah. with him into the temple. Yeah. And like, and then at his death, that 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 curtain into the king's palace that's mm-hmm. full of fine twine linens and yeah, yeah, onyx yeah, yeah. stones is opened and now we're it comes out to us and all the all, so some of those same stones mentioned yes in king out right. palace is mentioned in revelation that's right when jesus returns yes. and yeah. so god has come to us exiles and has brought us into his palace yeah and like and and i just think it's amazing that like like the the god who seems absent in esther in the esther story we see that that god it ha, it has made himself just immensely present and that yeah. he will bring us out of the empire of this mm-hmm. world. Like God will topple every kingdom. He will ultimately defeat the evil one. And we will never be in exile again when he comes. Yes. Like we will live with the king at a proper feast. Yeah. Not in a drunken stupor feast where yeah. all bad decisions are made. The wedding a, supper of the lamb. The wedding supper of the lamb where, where, where we feast in a holy way. Yeah. Like, that like maybe in Babylon we don't have a we just don't have a context for. I mean the Book of Esther does end with a feast. It does a celebration of the destruction of God's enemies and the mm-hmm. deliverance of God's people. Yep, it, that's the way the book ends, and it is a parallel to, to the, the opening feast that Xerxes throws at the very beginning. That's right, because the hope of God's people isn't um, self indulgent, uh, orgiastic, nope. shallow beauty, but the wedding supper of the Lamb fulfilling yep. satisfying yep like an actual an actual like in self like indulgence the right way yes <laughs> like, like because it's because of what it's celebrating it's yeah. not celebrating self-indulgence for self-indulgence's sake what that final feast was celebrating was the salvation of all people mm-hmm. or, or the salvation of god's people yeah and so like and like that for us is what we will celebrate forever at the marriage supper of the lamb yeah, we'll yeah. be celebrating the lamb who was slain for us like and i think i do want to lean into this fact that like like jesus is the jew sold for 10,000 yes. talents of silver he is like that is why we can celebrate that's why we can have hope in exile is because jesus allowed him like the jews were saved in this story right but jesus is the jew who was not saved yeah but he died and, and was allowed himself allowed himself to be sold so that he could purchase us out from exile to purchase yeah. us from the, the 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 penalty of sin and death yeah. and bring us into life into an eternal feast with him i have so much to say about that when we hit irony i know I'm so we'll excited i'm so excited so many cool things to talk about but for now feast feast there are only 25 instances of the word feast uh the, the word banquet uh-huh. used here in esther and i think like uh over half of them in the old testament half of them are all in the book of the book of Esther. Oh, there's like 25 in the Old Testament and, and half, half of them, them are, are, are used here. Wow. This is a book about feasting. It's a book about feasting. Wow. There's a, a self-indulgent, there's an empire, there's the, there's the empire's feast yep. and the people of God's feast. Yeah. We're invited to feast at the table of the one true God, mm-hmm. to come to the wedding supper of the Lamb, to celebrate him and not our pride, mm. to not our control that just slips away. The more we celebrate our own power, our own privilege, we'll find that it's ironically taken away from us by the same empire we think we're celebrating. When we trust the wedding supper of the Lamb, not even death can take it away. So good. How do we live in the empire today, especially in an affluent empire that celebrates feasting and self-indulgence? We feast and we celebrate and we rejoice in our salvation. Yes. That in our salvation was not because I pulled myself by, by my own bootstraps or because I inherited a lot of money or because I have the corner office. Mm-hmm. We celebrate in the fact that I was dead and now I'm alive. And like, and now we look around the empire today and we don't see people that we need to be jealous of in the empire that yeah. have more than we do. We see slaves. These people yeah. are in a harem. Yeah. These people are, are, are being blood sucked by the king and being oppressed. Yeah. And we've been set free. Yeah. 
like amazing. How do we? How Every do we, week we go to yeah. the church and we take a feast. A feast. Yes. Jesus's body and Jesus's blood. Yeah. For our salvation. Yeah. That's how we survive in yeah. exile. We feast on the one who will bring us out from exile. That's fun. Really good. Well, that's the introduction to the book of Esther. We said a lot. We said a lot. <laughs> There's a lot going on. There's Esther. a lot going on. I cannot wait to continue through this book. So uh, thank you guys for joining us, and we will see you next time.